This morning's first scripture reading is from Psalm chapter 91, verses 9 through 16 in the New Revised Standard Version of the Bible. Because you have made the Lord your refuge, the Most High, your dwelling place, no evil shall befall you, no scourge come near your tent, for he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all of your ways. On their hands they will bear you up, so that you will not dash your foot against a stone. You will tread on the lion and the adder, the young lion and the serpent you will trample under your foot. Those who love me, I will deliver. I will protect those who know my name. When they call to me, I will answer them. I will be with them in trouble. I will rescue them and honor them. With long life, I will satisfy them and show them my salvation. Word of God for the people of God. Our second scripture reading is from Mark chapter 10, verses 35 through 45. James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came forward to him and said to him, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. And he said to them, What is it you want me to do for you? And they said to him, Grant us to sit, one at your right hand and one at your left, in your glory. But Jesus said to them, You do not know what you are seeking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink? or be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? They replied, we are able. Then Jesus said to them, the cup that I drink, you will drink. And with the baptism baptism with which I am baptized, you will be baptized. But to sit at my right hand or my left hand is not mine to grant, but it is for those for whom it has been prepared. When the 10 heard this, they began to be angry with James and John. So Jesus called them and said to them, You know that among the Gentiles, those whom they recognize as their ruler lords, lord it over them, and their great ones are tyrants over them. But it is not so among you. But whoever wishes to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wishes to be first among you must be slave of all. For the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life life a ransom for many. Word of God for the people of God. Friends, let's pray. God, as we search your scriptures, may we find how they speak into our lives. May we find our place in your story and as the people of God in this story. May you be in every story we tell and every story we live. Amen. We're jumping back into a lectionary series, and so these are the scriptures that some powers that be choose for the yearly readings. And they usually give us a whole handful of scriptures to choose from. And one of the fun games as a preacher is reading those scriptures and seeing if I can connect how they're related, right? because some of them seem very different. And today we have Psalm 91, and then we've got a story from the gospel. And if you read them right from the start, they don't quite line up. I'm going to start in Psalm 91. Um, This is a pretty popular psalm that gets quoted a lot. One of my commitments as a person of faith and as a religious leader, as a pastor, um, is I spend a lot of time with people who have experienced scripture as a weapon who have experienced scripture telling them they're not good enough or shaming them or harming them. I spent a lot of time with people that would not walk back in the doors of a church. And one of the things I always commit to and I always look for in scripture is how has this scripture been used not for life, but for death? And Psalm 91 is one of those. So I always like to start with an acknowledgement of how it gets misused. Um, And in Psalm 91, as we were reading that, this scripture gets used to tell people that if you were just more faithful, you would have no bad things in your life. Right? We read from Psalm 91, 9 through 16. And in it, it says things like, 
Um, no evil shall befall you. No scourge come near your tent. He will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. Then it jumps down and keeps talking about this. This psalm has been used to tell people that if you were a little bit more faithful, bad things wouldn't happen in your life. Has that ever felt like the answer to life? And have you ever read a story of someone in the Bible that had no problems just because they loved God? It turns out most of the stories of loving God actually come with more problems in the Bible, not less. This scripture has been used to shame people instead. It's been used to skirt around dealing with issues and just said, well, if you were just more faithful, if you just loved God a little bit more, then maybe you wouldn't be having these issues. That doesn't feel like a life-giving scripture to me, um, nor is it in line with the Psalms. How many of you are familiar with the history of Psalms? couple of us, right? I was telling uh, John this morning that usually when we read Psalms in worship, people just go, oh, a nice little scripture, and we don't listen to it, right? We quote a lot of Psalms. Rarely are they our primary scripture. But the tradition of Psalms, actually most of them were written by David, or who we would refer to in the Bible as King David. And they were actually a lot of them written when he was on the run, because King Saul was chasing him down to murder him. He was threatened by David, maybe being the next king, by being anointed by God. <laughs> Saul had been treating David as his own son, brought him into the family, into the fold, and then hunted him through the desert to kill him. And while he was hiding from Saul, David wrote a lot of these psalms, turning towards God and lifting up praise towards God. Some of the Psalms come from Moses, because we know spent a good amount of time lost in the desert. Some of these Psalms come from other kings or some unknown authors, but this tradition of Psalms, of lifting up praise to God, we often just think of as it's these happy little scriptures, these happy little praises for God, and nothing more. Now, if I say praise do you all think like a positive connotation like uplifting joyous happy is usually what comes with that except that's not all there is to praise to praise god is to be in an authentic relationship with god which means coming as your whole self which means maybe some days you come and it's a joyous occasion and you do read them and you celebrate but how many of us also come to god on the not so good days a history of praise and psalms is not about just love God more and everything's going to be okay. What it is about is rooting yourself in a faith, in a relationship with God that offers us resilience. Story after story in scripture, story after story that we tell each other about our own lives of faith, they are stories of us finding resilience. Not because being a person of faith and loving God takes away all of your problems. It's not some magical fix-all. How many of you love God? How many of you still have problems in your life and everything's not perfect? <clears throat> when we read these scriptures and say, just love God a little bit more, you'll have no problems, and then we still have problems, this is why people walk away. This is why they leave. What does that scripture have to offer me? It turns out a lot more if we understand the tradition of the Psalms and we understand. I'm on the wrong page. Psalm 91, verse 15. When they call me, I will answer them. I will be with them in trouble. I will rescue them and honor them. We read that as like a literal rescuing of no more problems, fix things. With long life, I will satisfy them and show them my salvation. This promise from God, when they call to me, I will answer them. When you have called out to God, when things have been a struggle, how has God shown up in your life? 
in what ways has God shown up in your life? I think for a lot of us, that answer is going to be through other people, through the community of faith that surrounds us. We also move into the Gospel of Mark today. And in Mark, we're in chapter 10, verses 35 through 45. And there's this story that happens right before this, actually. It's the transfiguration. It's this big moment where Peter, James, and John get to be present, and they get to see Jesus' glory revealed that a lot of other people don't get to see yet. So they get to see this big transfiguration. It's this really big moment. Jesus is maybe a lot bigger than they thought he was, it turns out. And then James and John come, and they're sitting with Jesus. And here's how they start. James and John, the sons of Zebedee, who just witnessed that Jesus is probably this powerful, glorious figure, a lot bigger than they thought. They came forward to him and said to him, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. The audacity of them to show up to Jesus and say, You don't know what we're about to ask you. Please say yes. Right? This is like a little kid mentality. How many times has, does a small child come up and say, look, I'm going to ask you a question. I just need this, you to say yes before you hear what I say. Right? We're trying to secure that answer. James and John are trying to secure a seat at the right and the left of Jesus. Because suddenly they've witnessed this glory that the other disciples have not. They didn't turn around and tell their friends, hey, it turns out Jesus really is maybe the Messiah. But what they did was they turned around and they saw this glory of Jesus and this potential for them to also have glory. Which doesn't go over so well with Jesus. Instead, they missed the point. Which if you remember earlier when we were preaching in the Gospel of Mark, the disciples usually missed the point. They turned around they said, we want to sit at your right and you're left, we want to have the glory that you have and to be lifted up in that way. And I would guess that after witnessing the transfiguration, part of them are thinking, oh, maybe this is the Messiah that's going to conquer our enemies. They're right back in that Psalm 91 of maybe if we just love God, maybe if we just follow Jesus, we're going to have no problems. And the way we understand having no problems is by having power and glory. And if we could have that, everything's going to be okay. Jesus turns to them and says, you missed the point. That is not what glory is. Glory is not the might and your ability to crush other people. Glory is servitude. It's humility. It's all the little ways in which we turn around and show up for the people we love. The offering of a life of faith and a life with God is one not of perfection, but of resilience. And so often we find that resilience in our life from the people around us. The mandate of the gospel and of Christianity is to be in Christian community. It's not to be on your own. It's not to only worry about yourself and leave someone else. The mandate of the gospel is to show up and to love your neighbor. And when we can love our neighbors, or when we are the neighbor who can be loved and supported, then we find resilience. We find the ability to work our way through whatever life is throwing at us. Whether it's in community or in our families or in our jobs or just in our daily struggle to be human. God shows up and meets us in those complexities and calls us to meet each other there too. The gospel of resilience, a life that offers you something better because when you stumble, it's easier to get back up when someone reaches out a hand. This is what it means for us to be followers. Jesus turns to James and John and says, you missed it. Servitude, humility, showing up, loving people. This is where it's at. Then you get the other 10. 
When the ten heard this, the ten who were not there for this ploy, they began to be angry with James and John. James and John are not the only ones that missed it. The other ten showed up and took this as, you are going to try and get this glory. It's a, it's a power grab. And now they're also going to be caught in this struggle. These are the same disciples that when Jesus corrects and says, you missed it, it's about humility and servitude and a life of resilience. These are the ones that will deny him later. These are the ones that will argue over what inclusivity means about who is allowed to be in the kingdom of God. These are the disciples that are going to stumble. But they are also the disciples that are going to take that message to all corners of the earth. That will share that good news as their imperfect stumbling self who often miss it. And they are going to continue to show up and teach people what it means to show up and to love one another. To love your neighbor and to know that when your neighbor loves and cares for you, it gets a little bit easier to be a human in this world. Friends, if we could be people of faith that root ourselves there, not in this want for no more problems in our lives, but for the resilience to make it through. If we can root ourselves in community and be the kind of community that shows up for one another, where each of us has a give and a take, where there are days where you have more to give and there are days where you need to receive more. If we are rooted in a community that loves one another and loves our neighbors, then we will find that resilience as people of faith. Whatever that looks like in your life this week, may it be good and beautiful and may give you the encouragement to take your next most faithful step. Amen.